Istra Marks Generator In the region of Istra, about 40 miles from Moscow, stands a towering structure that rises above the forests and marks a technological high point in Soviet machinery. This is the Istra Marks Generator, and it's believed to be the largest generator of its kind in the world. Utilizing a series of electrical capacitors, it was able to turn energy from a low-voltage power supply into intense bolts of artificial lightning in order to test the lightning resistance of Soviet aircraft. Built by the Russian Electrical Engineering Institute in the 1970s, as part of the Istra High Voltage Research Center, the strange installation consists of a maze of tubes and cylinders, similar in appearance to a network of Tesla coils. Allegedly, its power output was so powerful that it formed lightning bolts hundreds of feet long with more concentrated levels of energy, present for just a fraction of a second, than all of Russia's nuclear, hydro, thermal, gas, coal, wind, and solo-generated power combined. In the 1980s, the location was also home to a facility called Allure, which was built to test and develop large weapons capable of generating electromagnetic pulses to devastate enemy technologies. However, this ill-fated facility met its end when the dome-shaped structure collapsed, and its commander was banished to a remote post as punishment. He was replaced by Boris Yeltsin, who would later become Russia's first president. Although officially abandoned in the 1990s, to this day, the Istra Marks generator is still fenced off and guarded with dogs. Despite this, a few holes in the fence have enabled urban explorers to venture in, but they do so at great risk. For reasons unknown, the Istra Marks generator tower is still occasionally turned on, and explorers report witnessing immense displays of electrical power. Bartini Beriev VVA-14 In an unassuming field near Moscow sits a prototype aircraft which, since its retirement, has fallen into a state of disrepair, its wings no longer attached, and many of its internal components scavenged or scattered around it. The VVA-14 was designed for the Soviet military in the early 1960s as a response to advancements in U.S. submarine technologies. Its designer, Robert Bartini, an Italian-born Soviet aircraft engineer, claimed that it would be the perfect predator capable of seeking out and destroying American missile submarines equipped with the new nuclear-armed Polaris SLBMs. The VVA-14's name describes its abilities clearly. It was a vertical takeoff amphibious aircraft, abbreviated VVA in Russian, with 14 engines that enabled it to hold a sustained flight path directly above the surface of the sea. It was intended that this groundbreaking method of flight would give it the edge over the U.S. submarines, while assisting it in radar detection evasion. Bartini designed several variations of the VVA-14, some of which boasted inflatable pontoons and folding wings. However, only one would ever be completed, due to the complexity of the engines required and the VVA-14's limited munitions capacity. Following Bartini's death, the VVA-14 project's development slowed, and it was eventually cancelled altogether. An inscription on his grave translates to, quote, In the land of the Soviets, he kept his oath to devote all life that the red planes flew faster than the black ones. Shortly after its retirement, the VVA-14 was sent to the Central Air Force Museum near Moscow, but this one-of-a-kind machine was unceremoniously looted and stripped of its wings en route. Experts at the Central Air Force Museum have proposed a restoration of the VVA-14, which they estimate would cost around $1.2 million and take several years. The present state of the only VVA-14 is a tragic reminder of the brilliance and ingenuity that individuals like Bartini can achieve, especially when motivated by war, but also of the burden of unrealized projects. The Buran. In a hangar adorned with graffiti and surrounded by rusting scaffolds and broken-down machinery, 
sits the dilapidated remains of a once heralded spacecraft. The carcass of this huge machine rests 1,500 miles southeast of Moscow in Kazakhstan, in a remote but still active desert spaceport. These days, the Buran, which translates to snowstorm or blizzard, is seen only by the most daring and intrepid urban explorers. Access to the location requires a 20-mile hike, and it is constantly under guard. At a glance, the Buran might be easily confused with the U.S. space shuttle, unsurprising given that it was designed using NASA's plans for its American counterpart that had been stolen by the KGB in one of the first major cases of internet espionage. Set upon a specially designed Energia super heavy lift rocket, the Buran only ever completed one uncrewed mission, which took place in 1988, shortly before the disintegration of the Soviet Union, which resulted in the suspension of the space program. In 2002, the Buran momentarily returned to the public eye when the roof of the building in which it was housed collapsed, a tragedy that cost eight lives and rendered the Buran completely unusable. It would never fly again. In recent history, the Buran was graffitied, which caused an uproar amongst many who were disgusted by the violation of a once great piece of engineering. Although viewed by most as a desecration of history, the graffiti perhaps poignantly reads, quote, Before climbing to the stars, a person needs to learn to live on Earth. Akronoplan Once one of the Cold War's most unique and innovative war machines, the Akronoplan now sits stranded in a few shallow feet of water on a Russian beach, surrendered to the sea. The Akronoplan is slowly being reduced to a mere husk of its former self, but a spectacular one all the same. The Lund-class Akronoplan, which resembles a traditional aircraft with vast wings, was capable of utilizing the wing and ground lift effect which enabled it to cruise at some of the lowest altitudes ever flown by a large aircraft. By riding a cushion of air above the surface of the sea, the Akronoplan experienced a minimal amount of drag and wingtip vortices, enabling it to fly at a height of just 13 feet, with a breathtaking top speed of 373 miles per hour. This led the International Maritime Organization to officially class it as neither a plane nor a seaplane, but as a maritime ship. By flying at such low altitudes, the Soviet Akronoplan was able to evade anti-ship mines while remaining undetectable to enemy radar until it was close enough to attack, which it could do with ferocity. The Lund-class Akronoplan was equipped with six N-22 Sunburn missiles, which could in turn be equipped with nuclear warheads. With its devastating arsenal, the Lund-class could sink the largest of enemy ships, including United States Navy aircraft carriers and destroyers. However, only one example was ever fully built, and it saw limited service with the Soviet Navy on the Caspian Sea from 1987 to the late 1990s, when it was finally retired. A 2020 attempt to tow the Akronoplan across the Caspian Sea from a naval base to a museum failed when it broke free of its tow cable and ended up on the Russian beach, where it can be seen today. More recently, an urban explorer named Lana Sater managed to wade out to the Akronoplan, which she then boarded and took several revealing photographs of the vehicle's waterlogged interior. Sater recalls, quote, Light bulbs were on, and a generator was humming very loudly. It was at this point that she and her companion noticed a security guard, who was somehow managing to sleep, despite the mechanical din which filled the Akronoplan. With their footsteps covered by the sound of the generator, they were able to sneak past the security guard and access the main chambers of this immense Soviet machine, as well as the cockpit, which had once required a crew of 15 to operate, but was now littered with food wrappers and waste left behind by the security guards and towing crew. After an hour of taking photographs inside the Lund-class Akronoplan, Sater and her fellow explorer tiptoed back past the sleeping guard, who had turned over in his sleep and waded back to dry land. Aircraft Carrier Minsk Few abandoned warships have seen such a varied retirement as the aircraft carrier Minsk. 
operational under the Soviet and Russian navies from 1978 to 1993 as part of the Pacific Fleet. The Minsk played a vital role in the Sino-Vietnamese War and served loyally for years. Most unusually, the Minsk spent much of her life in China, where she drew numerous tourists every year. The Minsk was the second of four sister ships built, which the Soviet Navy classed as heavy aircraft cruisers, owing to the fact that they were not only capable of transporting large numbers of aircraft and munitions, but that their bow was also packed with deadly rocket launchers. The Minsk's official service was to be short-lived, and was brought to an end after sustaining damage that could only be repaired in the newly independent Ukraine. But that was just the beginning of this ship's story. After fewer than 15 years of service, she was purchased by a group of Chinese businessmen for the sum of $4.3 million, with the intention of building a military theme park centered around the retired aircraft carrier. Minsk World, as the theme park was called, operated until 2016, when declining numbers of visitors forced it to close. At its height, the Minsk displayed various munitions and aircraft in staged wartime scenarios and was populated by large numbers of staff, all of whom wore mock military uniforms. As of 2018, the new owners of the Minsk have delayed their own plans for another theme park, which was intended to be opened on the Yangtze River in 2017. She now resembles a floating scrapyard 50 miles northwest of Shanghai, with farmland on one side and the Yangtze Bridge on the other. Recent history has seen daring explorers venture onto the Minsk to explore its haunting, rusted decks and unsettling installations, including sinister mannequins frozen in time, heavy artillery, munitions, and a range of aircraft, none of which are replicas. While the planned fate of the Soviet ship Minsk is an unusual one for such a significant military beast, one which most will find preferable to the alternative of dismantling it for scrap, it also serves as an indication of just how far the mighty can fall. Thank you for watching Dark 5. Be sure to like this video to show your support and tune in again next time for the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond. And let me know in the comments if there are any other Cold War curiosities I should investigate.